Worthy are you, Lord, to be Honor and praise for eternity For your blood has ransomed me Glory, Lord, belong to thee My home you made and welcome me shall be just and true are all your ways Lord I want to give you praise I love to gather with the saints singing all in one accord glory to the Lamb who reigns worthy Good morning, church. It's a pleasure to be with you again this second time. I come humbled and thankful to my brother, Mark, who's currently laid up. But I thank the Lord for his faithfulness all these years here. That shows a testimony of all your faces coming here still. But also more importantly, that you trust the Lord and not trusting man. Amen. Tonight, this morning's message is titled, Faithfulness, God's Unchanging Word. Faithfulness. God's unchanging word, and we shall be inside the book of Lamentations, which is after the book of Jeremiah, before the book of Ezekiel, Old Testament, again, in the book of Lamentations, chapter 5, last six verses. As you turn there, by way of introduction, Lamentations is a dirge, it's a poem, actually, it's poetry, and it's written, some believe, by Jeremiah in antiquity, but the writer is not identified inside the Book of Lamentations. It does not give a introduction. It just starts off in poetry. It's actually called a form of poetry called an acrostic. An acrostic is just simply when you begin each, cha- each verse with a letter. In this particular acrostic, it's the Hebrew alphabet. So the first chapter, the second chapter, and the fourth chapter all begin with 22, all have 22 verses because the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. As you know, the English alphabet has 26 letters. So the first verse of chapter 1 begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and so on and so forth. Chapter 3 is special because it has 66 verses. And it's still an acrostic, but every section, so verse 1, 2, and 3 all begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Verse 4, 5, and 6, the second letter. So it will be A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C. 66 times. And it's given that importance as it is the focal point of the lamentation. And chapter 6 actually has 22 verses, but it is not an acrostic. We see here that the writer here seems to have honestly lost hope. Because it ends with a question. Amen? So hopefully now you've turned to Lamentations chapter 5. We'll be looking at verse 16. Again, through 22. So Lamentations chapter 5, verses 16 through 22, we'll be looking at this particular text. Again, the title of the message is Faithfulness, God's Unchanging Word. Please join me as as we read the, the word of the Lord, and I'll pray. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this our heart has become sick. For these things our eyes have grown dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore to us yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now humbled and thankful. Your word is true and it is nourishment to us. Our hungry and thirsty souls yearn for you daily, hourly, minute by minute, second by second, hour by hour. We thank you, Lord, that you come before us through your scriptures that you display to us your word and your ways. Help us, Lord, to learn. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, 
and a heart to receive truth. And we pray in the old Anglican prayer, what we know not, teach us. What we are not, make us. What we have not, give us. And this, it's in the master's name of Christ we pray. Amen. Church, this morning we have before us the testimony of a writer who is lamenting. This is a dirge, which means a funeral march. It's written in a time of destruction. The time of the writing of this book of Lamentations is roughly 586 B.C. And what had happened is the fall of Jerusalem had come. The Lord of old had told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to keep his commandments. But this is older than that, for it comes from Moses. When Moses was writing to the people of God in Deuteronomy, which is the second law, towards the end of it, after his two long sermons, he tells them something important. I give to you life and death. Choose life, which is to fear God and obey his commandments. And as you know, those of you who are lovers of the Old Testament, Israel failed miserably. Even after the great exodus, which is what the Old Testament focuses on, the Old Testament focuses on the exodus. That is the precipice, the pinnacle of the Old Testament is the exodus because God delivers his people. And he tells them, before the exodus, look forward to what I do. And after the exodus, look back to what I did, my faithfulness. The people of God didn't raise a sword or a staff. God did all the work for them to, re- to be relieved of their bondage to slavery in Israel. And it's for this focus we look at Lamentations today. Because God's word came to pass. He was faithful. So if you're taking notes today, there's just three points I wish to make to you in this text. God's is the faithfulness of God's justice. We see this in verses 16 through 18. The faithfulness of God's justice. And in the next two verses, we see the faithfulness of God's mercy. The faithfulness of God's mercy. In the second two verses here, in verse 19 and 20. And finally, in verses 21 and 22, we see the faithfulness of God's words. The faithfulness of God's words. So these are just six verses. But in this, I hope to make these three points clear to you about the word of God here in Lamentations. Now, I wish to start by saying, On October 13th, 1972, a tragedy happened. Flight, Uruguayan flight uh, 571, was flying. It carried upon it 45 souls. These 45 souls consisted of many people, but mostly of a rugby team. It crashed in the Andes Mountains. This event was, was, was labeled the tragedy of the Andes in the world. But in the Spanish-speaking countries, and primarily South America, it was called the miracle of the Andes, or in Spanish, el milagros de de, de los Andes. I'm bringing this up because this this particular story actually had a movie called Alive. Some of you that are older know in the 93, I think it was in the 90s, there was a movie called Alive, which basically showcased this plane that crashed in the Andes, and over 45 people, a third of them died from the crash, and then six of them died from an avalanche afterwards. But miraculously, 16 people survived. Now, it's tragic because they were landed in the mountains of the Andes. And for those of you that don't know, these mountains are treacherous. They're high and they're stepped, which means that they're very steep. And on top of these mountains, there's no food. So in order to survive, they had to cannibalize and eat the dead of their their friends who died that were frozen. Now, I'm saying this to you to show what hopelessness can do to people. There's a saying that we all know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Everybody knows this. Now, the Christian knows this better because we know the hope we have is in Christ. Amen? But these people, for 72 days, they were rescued in December. The plane crashed in October. This was towards Christmas. And the world saw this as a tragedy, hence the title, The Disaster of the Andes. But the Latinos, those folks in the Latin countries, called it the miracle of the Andes. And you might ask why. Because God saved 16 souls. He spared 16 people. And those 16 people went on to live very amazing lives, some of which writing, obviously, tales of what happened. And they had a closer walk with God behind this. And I bring this up to set the the background of this particular text. The destruction of Jerusalem was devastating. This was done by King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Now, this happened because of one issue in the Old Testament, unfaithfulness. These people of God did not trust in God, for they had chased after many things. And God's judgment came to pass. Now, in the Old Testament, some have called this the day of the Lord. Today, as Christians, we hear about the day of the Lord. But our day of the Lord is spiritual. This day of the Lord had to do with God's judgment coming to bear upon sin. And like, likewise then, us today, we look forward to our day of the Lord because we know when God comes to judge, he will not judge those who are in Christ. So this day of the Lord will not be perilous for those who are in the Lord. But we see here the people of God. They were ravaged. They were destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem, the first temple, was utterly destroyed. It was razed. Now, today, we don't understand this very well because the concept of being raised to us means being lifted up. But what it means is every building was turned bottom over top. It was literally obliterated. This is why when you read Nehemiah and Ezra, that they come back and they weep when they look at the city, not just the walls, but the whole city was destroyed. And we see here the writer was in the midst of this. They didn't write this from a distance. This wasn't somebody asking questions. Be it Jeremiah who wrote this or whoever wrote this, they experienced this. You can hear it from the first chapter. It opens up with a funeral march by saying, Woe to us, we, the daughters of Zion, we, Jerusalem, have fallen. And you read quickly, by the time you get to verse 14, it says the issue, our unfaithfulness. So the question to you this morning, my brothers and sisters, is where does your faith lie? Where does your hope lie? The text here opens up amazingly by saying, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. This, brothers and sisters, is the chief mark of all of God's people. They quickly and immediately understand that when tragedy strikes, when judgment comes, especially by which comes from God, not when you slip and fall on ice, or when you're coming to work and you're late and you get reprimanded, or you don't do your homework, this is not God's judgment, that's your fault. This here is clearly seen that they ascribe their situation because of their sinfulness. So I love the way it opens up because it does not open up blaming God, it opens up praising God by giving him his righteousness, by saying, God, what you've done here is because of us, not because you are hard-hearted, Lord, but we are. But in this book of Lamentations, I want to first take a note here, because there's a hymn I love that's called Great is Thy Faithfulness. It is a popular Christian hymn, and the phrase Great is Thy Faithfulness comes from this book of Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 23. If you have your Bible, just quickly string back there. It's just a quick jump. But here we see... This verse is where this amazing hymn comes from. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Of course, if you have the King James, it's great is thy faithfulness. And if you don't know the song, I sang last time. I'm going to sing one more last time here because I think this is worth hearing. It says, great is thy faithfulness, God my, my father. There is no shadow or turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So you see here this lamentation, although it is a dirge, it is talking about destruction. It's pointing to the faithfulness of God. Brothers and sisters, if you are going through trial and tribulation, if you are under duress, the writer of Lamentations gave you this particular letter to sojourn through your sorrow. This particular Lamentation book is read to this day by the Jews, brothers and sisters. 
In, Ju- in the summertime, I think roughly July, but in the summertime, they read it. But not because of the destruction of the temple, the first temple, it's because of the destruction of the second temple by Rome in 70 AD. They read this whole lamentation as a way to raise up their hands to God and decry their tragedy. They use the words of lamentations to look back at the tragedy of the second destruction of 70 AD when the second temple is destroyed. So brothers and sisters, if we are of the people of God, and if suffering is part of our walk, where do you go when you are in dark corners? Where do you go when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death? Is this lamentation even sweet to you? Do you go to it for strength? Do you go to it to know that you're not alone? That there are others who've gone through horrible things and God in his blessedness has given us a word to go to, to be revived, to be restored, to be comforted, to be built up. This is amazing, brothers and sisters, because I think here we see a hope in hopelessness. None of us have been on a plane that crashed in the Andes, but we have been in lives that have crashed horribly here. Every brother and sister who knows the Lord looks back at what I'm going to steal from the previous preacher last week, at your putridness, at your disgustingness, at your foulness. The more you get closer to our Lord, the uglier you see your sin is. And it's not easy to raise your fist at God when you know what God did for you in Christ. What he overcame for you, what he took upon himself for you, how much he loved you, that you can say to him, thank you. Going into our text here, we see something interesting. God in his mercy came to us. He came to us like he came to Abram. Abram was not looking for God. God looked for Abram. And through Abram, a line came, and he made two promises, a covenant with him and his line and a a covenant with the land. Amen? He made a land promise and a people promise. And here we see the people are in the land. So this destruction is huge because not only is it taking the people of God who God chose out of a foreign people, Abram was not a people of, he was a foreigner. God chose him and he built him up into this amazing nation. And the two promises he had, he, he, not only did he attack them, he judged them righteously. And we see here through this judgment that the land was taken away from them. Babylonia now owns it. Read, read Nehemiah, read Ezra, and number two, the people of God dispersed. So the question you might have that I had that anybody has is, where is God's faithfulness in this? Where is his faithfulness? And we see it's in his justice. His justice. Back in chapter 3, verse 38 and 39, again, this is the first point, the faithfulness of God's justice. We see here, Inside chapter 3, verse 38 and 39, the word of God says this. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man about the punishment of his sons? The people here, brothers and sisters, aren't complaining to God about how bad it is. Because they know that from the hand of God come blessings, but also curses. Now this is hard for the unbeliever to hear. Nobody wants a God that's going to give you blessings and curses. But brothers and sisters, you have to take into account his justice. Nobody in their right mind can look at God and not want it to be just. We need God to be just. He must be just. For if you have ever been wronged, you want justice, amen? How much more for the God of love, the God of light, his justice, which is impeccable, his righteousness, which is unapproachable, his truth, which is unrefutable, that he said, I love you. He cast his love upon these people and said, you are my beloved, but you spurned me, you kicked me, you punched me, you spit at me, you turned your back, you played the role of the harlot. Inside chapter one, God talks about him being the husband of these people. For those of you who are married, you know what this means. The number one problem in America is infidelity in marriages. Amen? Amen. So we know this naturally, that in a marriage, the number one fear everybody has is, I hope they don't cheat on me. Where do you think that comes from? That covenantal love, that that, 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 that fear of betrayal. And how much more indignation do you feel if you are the righteous one? We are not righteous and we get mad. We know how horrible we are and we get upset. 
We put in prenuptials, and God put in no prenuptial. Because God knew our unfaithful hearts would turn. But in his mercy, his justice is born, it's come to bear here. And it is righteous. And we see here, again, in chapter 3, verse 38 and 39, the people of God here say, is it not the same God that gave us blessing, that gives us curses? And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, today, because of, the, because of prosperity gospel and this blessing gospel and this man-centered gospel, we somehow make it about us and not about God. And brothers and sisters, every cross begins with a horizontal beam, a vertical beam, before it gets a horizontal. Without your, without your vertical beam, your horizontal beam falls to the floor. Which means that as you build yourself up in God, then you can go out and love your brothers and sisters properly. Everybody who is a Christian has to work on their vertical beam. Trusting God in both the good times and the bad, in the blessings and the burdens. The judgment of God is always just. And we have to trust it. And I think today our fear is that somehow when God withdraws his blessing, he's withdrawing his love, his mercy, and most importantly, his word. And I've come to tell you, please do not do that mistake. Do not be like Job's wife, who when he saw Job praise God and tell God, naked I came, naked I returned to the Lord. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And for some reason, in our creature comfort, our amazing country of America, we forget that our God is faithful. Whether we have blessings or burdens, whether it's easy to be a Christian or it's not, the question becomes simply, as Jesus acts in the end of Matthew, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Believers, those who live lives that showcase what we see here, that when troubles come, you don't look at God and shake your fist. You look at God and say, do what you will, Lord. I will trust in you. Job says, though he slay me, I will trust him. Can you say that, brother? Can you say that, sister? Though he slay me, I will trust. This brother that wrote this saw dead babies, dead old people, princes who ran away and killed, prophets and priests who were crucified. But yet and still, he saw it fit to write this to us. What would you have written if everything you loved was destroyed? How would you have spoken? Where would your hope lie? Where would your comfort come from? This is a dark place, but it says here, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this our heart has been become sick. For these things our eyes have grown dim. They are properly placing the fact that God's justice is righteous. It's right. It's not wrong. It's not God's bad. It's not, well, maybe next time he judged and judged righteously. The people of God knew this. This is not new. It's news to us. None of us grew up with Deuteronomy right to us every day. None of us grew up with, they had heard all the testaments of God's promises in the Old Testament prior to this particular book. And at this point, Jeremiah, in the previous book, all 30 some odd chapters of it, talks about what? God's justice. And it came to bear. But you, brothers and sisters, when you look upon this, do you understand the context Let's go back to Deuteronomy real quick, 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19, 21. We see the justice that God put inside the people of God. He told them explicitly, justice shall be the mark of my people. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19 through 21. We see here quickly that justice and God's faithfulness to keep his justice is what hangs over the head of all of us. So for anybody in here who's currently thinking, well, you know, I do some things right. No, God does all things right. And for his people, he demands that same level. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19 to 21. Starting at verse 19, it says, You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This is what God wrote 
and spoke through Moses to his people. The standard by which they should be known is justice. And off top, towards the end of this lamentation, through poetry, now I couldn't write poetically like this, they, as we say today, they give up the ghost. They, they, they say the truth. We have not been just. We have not been righteous. We have not kept the standard by which you have told us to keep. We have not, we've taken bribes. We've turned aside. We've not walked the narrow path. They confess their sin. The Christian is marked through confession. There's something about a tragedy that humbles us to look inward and understand that our ways are not always his ways. It causes us to reflect upon which that is true. And the question for me, brothers, and the question for you in this text is what do we do when we are confronted with inequity, with injustice? Do we say, well, maybe this one time? Well, nobody will know. Or do we look back at the scriptures and know that our God is just and that he will judge in a righteous judgment? And our call is to always be like our son, I mean, our, the son of God, is to follow him. And he says one thing to all of us, be holy as I'm holy. Be holy as I'm holy, which means to be separate, which means to be above reproach, which means to be that person, brother or sister, who says, Ah, I can't do that. Or I have to do that. For my Lord is about that. My Lord speaks that. My Lord has shown that, not only through the word, but through his own testimony. He says, I do not do what I do. I do what the Father tells me to do. Whatever I see the Father do, I do. And Christian, whatever you see Christ do, do you do? The burden is always on us to realize, am I in the place where my Lord will have me? Am I having the posture that my Lord has? Do I have the mind of Christ? Do I have the heart of Christ? This is daily, by the way. There is no magical wand you can weave. There is no perfect scripture you can memorize. You have to bury yourself in Christ. I thank you, brothers, who sing these amazing songs because they remind me of who he is. As you can tell, I'm a singing preacher sometimes, and I sing hymns. But all these things help me, brother. Help me, sister, to remember who, whose I am and how I should be so that in the moments that come where I'm confronted with truth or things that aren't truth, I know what the will of God is in that to the best of my ability. Amen? So staying in Deuteronomy for a quick second, I want to look at Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. So just skip on up to Deuteronomy chapter 30 if you're already in chapter 16. And we're going to look at just a few, just to, uh, just Five verses here. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 through 20. This echoes what we just heard previously inside our lamentation. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 through 20. The word of God says this. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by the loving the Lord your God, by loving not rules keeping, loving, having passion, your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of the days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. So brothers and sisters, this declaration, this word of God, has come to pass. His justice was remedied in the full when God sent Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar to deal with the unfaithfulness of his people. This is not God being unjust. I want to make this clear. The Lord God had kept his word. He said to them way back in Deuteronomy, if 
you choose life, I will be with you. But if you choose death, my judgment will come upon you. And this has come to pass. The people of God were dispersed. They were scattered. And this, my brothers and sisters, is huge because we learn here the heart of our God is that he's just. His justice will always come to pass. There's never an unjust thing that happens that our God does not deal with. This is warm to us. This is comforting to the Christian because this is our God. This is the God that we serve. He is just to the uttermost. There's nothing that happens unjustly that he does not have a measure in, that he will not deal with. Today, sometimes, brothers, when you watch the news and you watch the times and you get discouraged because how can this be? How can this happen? And you have to come back to this text and know God is just, that his righteousness will not be mocked. His truth will always win. Not love, his truth. His love is truth. His mercy is truth. His justice is truth. That is what we have to rest in, brothers and sisters. So be careful when you look out and you say all these crazy things about our society. God is just. Nothing we see or have seen will ever not be judged righteously. Amen. Second point, the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of God's mercy. Now, the faithfulness of God's mercy is, is huge because we see this inside the next two verses, verse 19 and 20. It says inside the scripture, let me get it back up here, that when God came to them, in verse 19 to 20, he says, but you, oh, verse 18, sorry, verse 18, verse 18, um, for the, the mount, oh, sorry, 18. For the mount, for mount, for mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures for all, to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Now, Mount Zion in this text represents Jerusalem. But Zion, Mount Zion is actually where David put his citadel. And that citadel is where the actual Ark of the Covenant was and all the preciousness and blessed things of Israel were kept there. Now, Mount Zion actually was never part of Jerusalem initially. If you think back in the Old Testament, back in Genesis, where, where Mount Zion lied, the Jebusites re, re, uh, resided there and they, had, they built a fortress there. When David came and took over and won and had the place called the City of David, Jerusalem, he built a citadel where that fortress was. And it's within that citadel that Moses, that Solomon came and built his temple and everything else. So Mount Zion was where obviously God's presence would come down whenever the priests would go in. So Mount Zion is a physical place. But in the scriptures here, we see that Jerusalem is called Zion, and the special place where David built the citadel was is called Mount Zion. And he says here, the writer, that jackals prowl over it. A jackal is just symbolism meaning undesirables which for us here in the biblical tense is the Babylonians. They sacked it, they took all the stuff out, the gold, the riches, everything. They raised it, they broke it down. Hence the term jackal. So we see here, though, that this is God's justice still. But in verse 19, it turns to God's mercy because the question is put forth. But a statement is made and a question follows it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. We see here that they make a a statement that regardless of the fact that what we see going on here, God is still in heaven reigning. Brothers and sisters, God's position never mirrors our position. Our situation is temporal. God has opposed, presupposed the time today, right now, for the repentance of sin. God has opened up the windows of heaven and sent down his son that we might turn to him. But in heaven, in glory, God is reigning. Justice prevails. And it says here strictly that his throne endures. Again, the Jews had an amazing way of constantly reminding themselves that God is just, but also he reigns. His sovereignty is never challenged. His position is never threatened. Even though Zion, which is the place that God came to dwell on earth here in Jerusalem, was destroyed, the throne room of heaven is untouched. It's spotless. It is perfect. We see that the mercy of God is available because God himself has not been dethroned. Because the people of God have been crushed on earth does not speak of God in heaven. And we have to remember this, brothers and sisters, during our trials, that God in his place, in his throne, in his righteousness, his throne room is never threatened. 
God's place of residence is never assaulted because God's justice comes down from heaven, not goes up from earth. Amen? God came down to bring righteousness to us. So why then do we read here, but you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. A declaration is made during sorrow, during sadness, that God is still God, that he is still who he says he is. He has not changed, even though we might and do. God never changes. And you have to take this in deeply because this will hold you, brother. This will keep you, sister. Because we tend to forget that God is God and we are man. We are women. We are flesh. What we have is perishable. He came to give us that which is imperishable. We walk around in tents. We know in the New Testament but we will get a new body that will not be like these tents. They'll be permanent. They'll be perfect. This is hope, brothers. This is grace. This is mercy. When you put your hope outside of yourselves, like in the beginning of Ephesians or even Galatians, it talks about this, 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 our hope is where? It's in heaven. And this here statement points to the mercy that comes from heaven. If you are going through a trial and you're looking to anything on the earth, I don't care if it's that amazing doctor you have, those drugs you're taking, that, that whatever it's going, the hospice care you're having, that will fail. That will always be limited. But the throne room of God is never limited. It's never empty. It does not run out. It is never, ever depleted. And this has to be seen here because if during the trial, whatever you're going through, you do not recognize that which you trust in, that which you go to for hope, it sits in a place that is unchallenged. You will always be trodden, stepped upon, hopeless. And for those of you here who do not know Jesus, the truth is your hope is hopeless. This does not apply to you. Only those who have repented of their sin and turned and trusted in everything in Christ can have this kind of assurance. This does not come to the unbeliever. God does not see you. He sees his son, and those who are in his son see this. So if you do not know Jesus, I beg you, I plead with you, turn to him today. If you've been hiding and running from God, he's been drawing upon you. If the Spirit is drawing you to the Son, hear the letter from the Father. Repent. The day of atonement has passed. God paid the ransom for your sin. You can trust in Jesus. He is faithful. This truth, this hope, this mercy does not come to all those, to everybody. It comes to those who are the people of God. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it is the church which started with Israel, by the way, in case people forget that. But this statement, this mercy, the faithfulness of God in his mercy starts here by recognizing where your hope comes from, where your strength comes from, where your truth comes from. It comes from heaven, where God resides. And the second part of here is the question in verse 20. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Now, I hope you see the issue with this statement. It's taking your fingers and pointing them up at the sky and saying, you messed up. But as my mom told me, whenever you point one finger up, three point back at you. Amen? Three fingers point back at you. And we come to this text realizing that the onus of the mercy is never in man. It's in God. This we see back in Lamentations again, chapter 3. I told you, chapter 3 is kind of like, you know, the, the, the focal point or the high point of Lamentations. Verse 40. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40, we see why this is important. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40, one sentence. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. So you see the statement here that says, why do you forget us forever? God does not forget, brother. God does not forget, sister. You know who does? You do. And you do. And you do. And I do. So the statement in Lamentation chapter 3 helps us understand this verse 20 here in chapter 5. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Now understand, please, these people are desperate. 
So we can't just throw fingers and rocks and say, uh -huh, you messed up. We have to understand that sometimes we'll get here. Sometimes you'll get here. And I'm coming here to encourage you and let you know that look at verse 40 of chapter 3. And let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Now, for you New Testament people that say, okay, Ron, that's good and well for them, but what about me? I'm a New Testament Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. You've heard this. Just write it down if you want to write it down. But 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you realize not, or sorry, or do you not realize that this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So Paul here is presenting to the churches in Corinth a test. It's a simple test, and I'm going to just make it plain for you. Is the Spirit of God in you? Are you reborn? Is your heart flesh or stone? When you sin, do you get convicted? And when the conviction comes, do you receive it or do you rebuke it? When a brother or sister comes to you with a fault that you may have committed either willfully or Accidentally, do you receive that rebuke? Do you receive it or do you push them back and say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Remember last year when you, you know, when you, and we know about your, what is your heart, brother? What is your heart, sister? Do you examine yourself to make sure that the Spirit of God resides in you? Or do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Brothers and sisters, this statement, why do you forget us forever, can be flipped and says, God, why do you forget me forever? And you forget that the temple of God is now you. It's no longer a tabernacle outside. He says, I wish to, to tabernacle in you. I wish to be in you. So when you go through a trial, when you're brought to account on something, I hope this church does discipline. Matthew 13, 18. When that happens, do you run or do you stand and take it? Because they love you and because you love them and receive the rebuke? Did you examine yourself and say, how am I? Do you want brothers and sisters to speak into your life, or do you try to hide yourself and block people and keep the brothers and sisters of this church, not of the world, of this church, from helping you be more like Christ? Or do you say, you know, I don't want to, I don't want them to, to know that because they know that they're going to hate me. And God doesn't say that. He says, examine yourself to make sure you are in the faith. And brothers and sisters, we can't do that on our own. I'm biased. You're biased. I have creature comforts, things that I go to that I shouldn't go to. And God blessed me with a wife who knows me very well. But I also have brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts, nieces, nephews in the church who help me. And my question is, what do you say? What do you do? Does 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, does Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40 sound like you, or are you more like Lamentations chapter 5, verse 20? Do you point up at God and say, why? Why me, God? Why? When you just say, God, why me? Your son came for me? He died for me? This is huge because we tend to throw what's called pity parties for one. Our little violin is playing, and we're singing a song of how bad it is for us, and we forget that he who is perfect came down for that which was dead. So in this particular text, I want to also focus on Psalm 51, because David had the same problem. Psalm 51, just first two verses, Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2. We see here in the Word of God, Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2, again, just real short. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You see how that contrast different from why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? The focus is no longer on why did you do something wrong? It's I did something wrong. Come and help me. Come and clean me. Come and examine me. You're inviting God down to come and do the work of making sure your walk, your sin is covered and confessed and repented of. Now, a man by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a 19th century preacher from England, 
wrote a magazine that came out every month on the first of the month. It was called The Sword and the Trial. In the November 1st, 1870 edition, he wrote a short commentary on Psalm 51. Now today, I don't know if that would sell that well, but back then it sold like hotcakes. Now again, I'm going to read to you a pretty decent section of it, but I believe it will help us understand exactly the faithfulness of God and his mercy. And again, he's writing a commentary on Psalm 51 and how we should look at it. So please just open your ears for a second and take notice of this. He wrote this. The one sin against, ba against Bathsheba served to show the psalmist the whole mountain of his iniquity of which that foul deed was but one falling stone. He desires to be rid of the whole mass of his filthiness, which though once so little observed, had then become a hideous haunting terror to his mind and cleanse me from my sin. This is a more general expression as if the psalmist said, Lord, if washing me will not do, try some other process. If water avails not, let fire. Let anything be tried so that I may be purified. Rid me of my sin by some means, by any means, by every means. Only do purify me completely and leave no guilt upon my soul. It is not the punishment he cries out against, but the sin. Many a murderer is more alarmed at the gallows that's the hanging nooses in case he puts on gallows. The gallows, then at the murder which brought him to it. The thief loves the plunder, though he fears the prison. Not so, David. He is sick of sin as sin. His loudest outcries are against the evil of his transgression and not against the painful consequences of it. When we deal seriously with our sin, God will deal gently with us. When we hate what God hates, he will soon make an end of it to our joy and peace. Again, this was from The Sword and the Trial magazine, November 1st, 1870. Brother Spurgeon gave us great insight into which way our fingers point when we are in distress. And I hope through this text and through some of these other helps, you see that as you're going through a trial, careful where you point your fingers, careful whom you blame, careful where you go. Look to him who is faithful. Again, this is under the second point of the faithfulness of God's mercy. Coming to the home stretch here, we're in the last section, and we see here, we're coming to the last two verses that says the following. Restore to yourself, O Lord, that which may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. This is massive because it showcases one big point. God is able. God is able. He was able to be just and merciful, but in this last section, again, the title of this last section is just simply, the faithfulness of God's words, his words. God does not speak in vain, brothers and sisters. He speaks with purpose. Our Bible begins with God speaking. In the beginning, boom, God spoke. So do not take lightly when the God sees it fit to pen you 66 love letters, 66 tales about himself and his mercy and glory and how he chooses to use broken, crooked, and wicked sinners to showcase his glory. So we see here, it begins with, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. The writer here is pointing to something. But I believe what he's pointing to is more prior to this particular book. So let's go back one book to Jeremiah towards the end of it in chapter 31. We see here what the lamentation, or the, or the writer of this lamentation in this last verse, in verse 21 is saying. In chapter 31 of Jeremiah, I think... He is pointing to a truth that God said to the prophet Jeremiah that he is now recalling. He's bringing it back to the forefront and saying, God, you said this. And he's holding God accountable to his own word. This is not sin, brothers and sisters. This is good because the words of God are truth. They are life. Chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. 31 to 34. We're going to take a look at what Jeremiah the prophet says by the way of God. 
It says here, starting at verse 31 of Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declare the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my new, sorry, I will put my law within them and I will write on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This was said before the destruction of Israel. This was said before 1586. This was said before the tragedy that happened in the destruction of the temple and the town of Zion, of Jerusalem, which is Zion. So the writer of of Lamentations is remembering, God, you said something that we didn't see then. And the justice that you have prescribed, we have now seen. But you gave us hope. Your words hold an account to us. We take your words in and now bring them back to you and say, you said you will do something great. And we're calling you on that. Brothers and sisters, does the hope God gives you in the truth of the scriptures come to you when you look forward to him? When you look at him? Do you say, Jesus, you told me in John that you will never leave me nor forsake me. Jesus, you said that you will never let anybody pluck me out of your hand. No sin can overcome me. Everything I have gone through and will go through, you've gone through. Or do you forget that? Do you hold God to account on his word? Do you hold God to the standard by which he holds all of us, which is his word? When you walk through whatever you're walking through, be your blessings and abundance. Do you say, God, you've given me much? Don't let me be like the rich rich young prince and take my possessions and act like this makes me special. How shall I minister with this stuff? Whatever it is. God, you've given me three blessed kids. God, you've allowed me to adopt five blessed kids. How shall I treat them? How shall I use them? These are arrows you've given to me. Psalms. Amen? You've given me things to use here, Lord. Or do you just look at yourself and look at your stuff and say, I need bigger barns. This is too much stuff. Brothers and sisters, this is huge because it's saying to God, your word means something to me. Your words are faithful. You don't speak in vain. What you say comes to pass. Whether I see it now or I see it in glory, I can trust you. And we see here, the writer says, restore to us yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Who would say that after looking at broken walls? Dead people. People taken away. How can you have this kind of hope? Naturally, you cannot. Only supernaturally you can. Today, brothers and sisters, we have a hope that is bigger than what they have. We get to see the full counsel of God. They didn't have, you know, judges the way we have today. They had scrolls. They had to go to a priest or to a scribe. You could have it inside the ESV, the NASB, the LLT, whatever version you want. You have a bunch of extra Bibles over there. How much hope do you have? They can write this with the little they had, but they memorize much, though. So I don't want to make it sound like they know. They memorize a lot more than we memorize. But I want to say to you, where does your hope come from? Is it the words of God or the words of man? Is it past history performance and your prospectus? Or is it actually the words of God? Do you hold God accountable by what he says? Is his word meaningful to you? Do you trust him? Do you believe that he is a liar? C.S. Lewis said either God is a liar, lunatic, or Lord. Which of it is he for you? Is he crazy? Is he a, a fibber? Or is he Lord? And the second part of this It says, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. Any child who has had a parent that's been mad with them knows this. When your parent, your teacher, your pastor is upset with you, you feel this way. Sometimes. 
But I, I wish to put before you a person who I believe says this better than all of us could say it. We're going to the one time we're going to the New Testament, chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. We'll look at John the Baptist. He says something very similar to this here that we see in verse 22. Remember, Lamentations 5.22 says, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry. There's a doubt being put before God, a doubt. And let's not act like we don't know that. <laughs> We're human. Doubting is what we do best. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verse, 20, verse 2 through 6. We're looking at John the Baptist, who's currently being put in prison by King Herod. John spoke to Herod, the king of the Jews, and said to him, what you're doing by sleeping with your brother's wife is not good. He didn't like that. So he had him put in jail. Starting at verse 2 of chapter 11, the word of God says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus enters the doubt of John the Baptist. And in case you don't know who John is, read after this. Jesus tells you who John is. He says, of born, born of man, there is none greater than John the Baptist. But even in heaven, he's, he is less than the least of the one in the kingdom. But saying basically that John is on point. John got his stuff right. He has his Christology correct. But even here, the man who loves Jesus more than Peter did, by the way, has doubts. And what does Jesus say? Does he say, hey, 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 you my cousin. Uncle Zacharias, that's my family. What's wrong with you, dude? Come on. Remember the barbecues we used to go to? Remember we used to play in the brook? He does not walk down memory lane with him. He, he says things to him that I think you take note about this. He says things to him here. He says there, go and tell him. The blind receive the sight, their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Where is Jesus getting this from? I'll tell you. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 and 6. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. I'll say it again. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 and 6. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, he gives John the Baptist the words of God. He quotes to him Isaiah. And obviously pointing to himself because in that particular verse, I'm telling you, he points about the hope and read Isaiah. It's a long book, but it's worth it. But Jesus does not tell him about nostalgia. He does not talk to him about the many times they hung out and how their dads are, you know, related and family and all that. No. He repeats to him the words of God. The book of Isaiah is what comforts John the Baptist. We do not know how John felt when he died, but we did know this. God chose to remind him about the words that he spoke in Isaiah. And as you know, when Jesus first came to speak, he grabbed the scroll of what? Isaiah read it and says, upon you hearing this scripture, it's been fulfilled. And of course, people got confused and upset. But the point is, Jesus always points back to God's word. You know it. Jesus says, I did not come to overthrow the law, but to fulfill it. So what brother, what sister do you do when you're going through trial? At the end of your rope, what do you call upon? Is it Nostalgia, you know, back in the good old days. Or do you say, God said something that I need to trust? God's word is not meant to be played with. It's not just something, um, it's not a hist this isn't a history book. This is the book of life for those who are called, but a book of condemnation for those who do not know him because everything in here testifies about the goodness, the greatness, and the justice of our God. And we see that the doubt seen here by the, lament by the lamentation it's not bad, brothers and sisters. It's not. We do this. We look at God and say, are you there? And the response is never, well, you know, look back at the history. It's look at what he said. 
Look at what he said. Look at what he said. This is a burden for me to make sure that I know the Bible well, because when I'm despondent, when I'm in that dark place, I don't go by nostalgia. I go by what God said. I have to, because his word never, ever fails. I'm going to read to you a little something and end it with this way. John Newton was a British slave trader. John Newton was a British slave trader who later became an abolitionist and converted to Christianity. He came to be a clergyman and a songwriter. He is most famous for writing the lyrics to another historical hymn, Amazing Grace. But I'm not going to sing to you again this morning. <laughs> In closing, I would like to read to you an excerpt, a piece of Newton's family prayers. Now, hopefully you brothers and sisters, you guys have devotionals you do as a family. He would write down the family prayers. This is an excerpt of one of his family prayers. If you want a copy of it, you can get it afterwards. But hear this. I want you to take this in because he wrote this as part of his family prayers. I am not what I ought to be. Ah, how imperfect and deficient. I am not what I wish to be. I abhor what is evil, and I would cleave to what is good. I am not what I hope to be. Soon, soon shall I put off mortality, and with mortality all sin and imperfection. Yet though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say I am not what I was, what I once was, a slave to sin and to Satan. And I can heartily join with the apostle and acknowledge by the grace of God, I am what I am. Brothers and sisters, this lamentation is huge because it showcases the justice of God in his faithfulness, in, to be just, his faithfulness, to be merciful, and his faithfulness in his words. These are things that you should take in, imbibe in them, which means to drink them deeply. Some of you might be hearing this and you're like, yeah, yeah, I know. But one day the Lord will bring it to your knees as he brings all those who he loves. And I pray this message comes back to you and revives your soul and gives you a hope that is unspoken of by the fact that he is faithful. He is faithful. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you now thankful and grateful that although we are not what we ought to be, what we wish to be, what we hope to be, we thank you, Lord, that we are what we are. We ask, Lord, now that these words minister deep into our souls, that we come before you now humble and naked, trusting that you will do what you say you're going to do, that you will keep your covenants, for you are a holy and righteous God, and nothing Nothing is impossible for you. I thank you, Lord, this morning for being able to speak to your brothers, to my brothers and sisters, your children, that they might be built up, rebuked. I pray for the, the friend who came in today who has heard or maybe not heard the gospel before and is now listening to you, Lord, is drawn to you by, by the Spirit. I pray, Lord, that that man or woman that heard this truth, that young lady, a young man, is believing upon you, repenting and turning to you for all truth and all peace, for you are gracious. You are awesome. We thank you, Lord, for these things. We ask and pray for them in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, church. Worthy are you, Lord, to be For your blood has ransomed me Glory, Lord, belong to thee My home you made and welcomed me To you, O oh Lord, my thanks shall be Just and true are all your ways Lord, I want to give you praise. I love to gather with the saints, singing all in one accord. Glory to the Lamb who reigns. Worthy are you, Lord. Holy is your 
your name The great amazing works proclaim You are so worthy, Lord, to be Praise with all there is in me I love to gather with the saints Singing all in one accord strength and security very help in time of need every trial please work in me 